Hello there. Uh, so, I'm a software engineer at Mendeley, and what do we have to do to this one last time? Oh yeah, turn it on. That helps. Uh, so for a living, I work on a desktop app. It's called Mendeley. It's a little bit like iTunes or Evernote, but instead of dealing with music or uh, notes, it deals with research papers. Uh, it's a cross-platform app, so we built it for Mac. It runs on Linux, and it runs on Windows as well. And it has a lot of things that you traditionally couldn't do very easily on the web. So it has to be offline. Um, we have people who take, take this app and w when they're out on field trips in God knows where in Africa, and internet connections are not great out there. Um, it has to manage a lot of data. And it's also, there are some parts of it that are fairly performance sensitive. It's built using traditional desktop -y frameworks. So Qt, Coca, Windows. Um, of course, you know, we started building it some years ago. And the web moved on a long way since then. And um, so if you end up using these technologies and you build an app across three platforms, you effectively end up building a, most, a lot of what you would have found in a browser. You end up doing a lot of work that duplicates what you would find in a browser engine anyway. So the question is, now fast forward to 2015, can we build something like this for the web? Um, well, that's a, this app is a, is a fairly big thing, 250,000 lines of code. So it's a bit, a little bit difficult to go and re rewrite it in a few days. So I figured. Let's try it on a hobby project, something that has some of the same requirements, needs offline, needs to be able to sync with the web, uh, needs, to, and needs to have some performance sensitive parts, and so on. So I figured find a problem to solve. Um, I imagine a number of you will have something like this as well. You have everything these days requires an account. Uh, at the last collection, I have over 200 online services I have an account on. Some of these I could use social logins for, but unfortunately a lot of them, internal services and so on, I can't. And as Miguel said, you, you want to get a stuff across every platform. So Linux, Windows, iOS, Android, and I'm playing around in, in virtual machines and Chromebooks, you name it. And the only platform that's on all of those is the web. Uh, so this is not a new thing. There's plenty of tools out there. Um, this is one of my favorites, just not available for my Linux laptop and many of the other browsers I use. So I figured, let's take this app and using 2015 technologies, um, build it for the web. Uh, and the first time any desktop, anyone who's used traditional app frameworks comes to the web, they have all this choice. Do I go for Ember? Do I go for Angular? Do I go for React? Um, one thing we know for sure is that just trying to do it with HTML is going to be rather difficult. So using these frameworks kind of gives us a chance to have a look at you know, what's it like to build with, say, uh, what's it like to build an app with Ember, Angular, or React, and how does that compare to, say, building it with a traditional framework like Coca or um, Qt? Um, and Ember in particular is, is modeled off Coca, so I would have hoped, in a, in a way, a fairly similar experience. Uh, so that was about a year ago. Uh, since then, I've been busy. And the question is, you know, what have I learned after, uh, of how it compares after a year? So there's, there's a number of areas of differences. But I think what it all boils down to is that the heritage of the two. So the web was started off as a platform for showing documents, then a platform for showing documents and running some scripts. And that was good enough that people could build apps with it. Uh, but an actual evolution into an app platform is something that's really only happened incredibly recently, as in sort of mid-2013. Mid uh, whereas the app frameworks, on the other hand, they've always been about apps. And that has, that has a couple of impacts on, on how you build things. The first is, oh, hang on. Well, the, main, the one I'm going to... The one I'm going to talk about is essentially, no, the, the, the comp uh, what I'm going to talk about is how the, the, your app is structured and what the fundamental building blocks are. In a document platform, you're dealing with things like links, um, 
images, etc. Fairly small things, and you're and you're generating markup for it. Uh, so in Ember, for example, the way essentially you, you're working is you've got your templating thing, which effectively is a string, is a, it ultimately is a markup generator. It generates a string and shoves that into the DOM, which when you're busy generating a document is fine. Um, on the other hand, in an app framework, the fundamental unit block is a, is a bigger thing, a more complicated thing. It's the widget or the view. They have different terminologies. And that has a, a couple of important th concerns. The first, well, has a couple of important impacts. The first is that the tools you're building on top of, they're meant, you know, they have that built-in concept of the widget, this higher level component. Uh, in browsers, on the other hand, they're still very much dealing with the, the lower level elements, the divs, the apps, and so on. You can get tools like for React, the React tools, which understand the framework, and they will understand the components on top, but it's not yet a native thing in browsers. The other thing is when you come to debug, everything happens at the widget level, whereas in the browsers, um, you can have the framework to build the app, but when you come to debug it, you're usually still working at the lower level. The second thing, and this leads on from Miguel's talk, is about control and performance. So with documents, when you've got limited interactivity, generating a markup string, throwing it at some browser engine, and ultimately that builds a set of, a set of nodes, a set of, uh, a set of state, that works fine. For apps, on the other hand, the components you're dealing with are much more complicated. Um, and I'll show you, oh, I'll go back to that in a sec. Um, so I'll go forward a couple of slides. So just to give you an idea of how complicated these components are, I took a look at how much code there is in typical things that you find on, like, say, your mobile, your, uh, your Android device or your iPhone. So a text view in Android is, nearly, is, not, is over 9,000 lines of code. And I was surprised to learn that a text view is actually used as the base class for buttons. So if you have a button on screen, there's over 9,000 lines of code powering that. So when, something, so when someone describes something as feeling native, little details, that's a lot of details. Uh, a lot of performance optimizations, a lot of tuning going on. And inside those 9,000 lines of code, um, something that app frameworks will give us is a lot of control over, a very fine get drain control over the painting, the event processing, the layout, the timing, concurrency. If, for example, we have a, a viewer that needs to do some expensive computation, maybe, for example, a, a PDF viewer, then if it needs to go and do some work in a background thread, it can do that without the rest of the application having to care. Um, and you have all this, so all this complexity is nicely, usually nicely isolated from the rest of the application, and you can go down as, as many levels as you need to. Until recently, this wasn't really possible on the web. You had these building blocks of a certain sort of level in the stack, the attributes, the, sorry, your links, your divs, and so on. But if you needed to do something uh, down at the fine grain, down at the fine grain level, you couldn't really do it. And this is where, uh, in mid-2013, um, browser vendors looked at this, and they figured that, well, you can build these higher level features when people ask for them, but the problem is the native app frameworks will always be a step ahead. So back in 2013, one of the complaints people had is, I want iOS style scrolling. Um, you know, and there were a number of details you needed to have. To ha there was a lot of, that you had to do to get that. Fast forward to mid-2014, and now the next problem that can't, is difficult to implement in native, sorry, in web frameworks will be the Android lollipop style scrolling. And you couldn't go and add each of these as a feature. So the plan instead was, to add these layers to the web, to take existing high-level features like CSS and HTML, and to provide instead lower-level features which, which explain them. Guys, who here has heard of the extensible web? So the concept instead is that rather than in browsers um, spending your time building the higher-level features, what they figured is that the development community at large, as they've shown with JavaScript, is pretty good at if, you know, if they've got the tools, they can build these higher level features. Most of the JavaScript code we've seen this evening is using ES6, but no shipping browser supports it fully. Um, even things like, say, classes, are, you know, they're, very, they're, they're still being built in the native browser, but we can use them today because we can polyfill them. 
So the plan is to take that thing, that, to take that idea that uh, has been applied to JavaScript and apply it to the rest of the web as well. Uh, so you can read about this at the extensible web manifesto.org and two of the signatories are Yehuda Katz and Tom Dale, so the core Ember team and also noticeable signatories from Mozilla, Google, the W3C and so on. And the key thing about this is whereas a lot of what goes on in the browser at the moment, for example, exactly what goes on when you specify a flex, a certain a, a CSS layout is sort of effectively magic. You can you can futz around and try and get what you want, but if it doesn't quite behave the way you want, whereas in a native framework, you could always go to the next level down and implement it. Uh, in CSS, you couldn't really do that. And that's something that's likely to change over the next year or so. So here's a bunch of examples of where existing features on the left that we have are being taken and a lower level feature is actually being created below them that sort of explains how it works. So Miguel talks about service worker. Um, the app cache was what was actually built first of all, and the idea is using service worker, you could have built something like app cache. But rather than run into the problem of app cache where they built it, then the work people tried to use it and found that it didn't do what they wanted. Instead, you would build something like service worker first of all. Then the development community would experiment at large. They would find out what kind of higher level APIs work well. And then those, perhaps, can be standardized in the browser. Um, so for CSS, something that's only very started to be kicked off is something called the CSS Houdini project, which is where things that are a part of CSS, so for like the box model, fairly fundamental things for which you don't really have a JavaScript API, you will have a proper API for that. Uh, web components has been a long story now. It's, it, it's, it, 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 you know, there, there, are, there are blog posts on, on, the, on HTML5 rocks that go back, I think, to 2013. And so, yeah, it, the advertise it as if you can use it right now. But um, fast forward and, yeah, if, if you consider Chrome the web, you can use it. But otherwise, not so much. And JavaScript, uh, actually, just by virtue of being really, just by virtue of making engines faster, you can polyfill a lot of things. Uh, so, for example, one of the things I needed in the project I was working on was uh, high-speed, high, really performant cryptography. Uh, and I was surprised to discover that if I took JavaScript and wrote JavaScript like it was C code and used, a bit, used some uh, so ASM.js style JavaScript, that I could polyfill web crypto, even though no browser ships it at the moment. Uh, and language features, so ES6, some ES6 language features, you can polyfill them in ES5 at a performance cost, but it's low enough that it's not a problem. So the question is, if we have this low-level control, does that get us to a point where we can implement components like a, a, as good, that are as good as an Android list view or, a, um, let's say, a UI table view or something like that in our apps? And the problem is, back to this again, there's a lot of code in these components. So even if we did have all the controls necessary to implement it, um, and not only is this a lot of code, but it's also continually evolving code. So we'd have to spend a lot of time trying to emulate it. There's a lot of aesthetic and behavioral details. There's lots of magic constants about exactly how fast something moves when you flick it on the screen. There's lots of subtle performance optimizations. Uh, it changes you know, every release of the native framework. And this is something that Qt tried to do for a long time. On our desktop frameworks, they were sort of able to get away with it because platforms like Windows and Linux were pretty slow moving, and Mac relatively as well. Fast forward to mobile, and there's a new major version of iOS and Android every year, or even faster than that, and that's not really going to work. So the question is, if we can't duplicate these components, uh, is there, what else could we do to provide a really rich experience? Uh, one option is go and build another a UI framework on top, or a UI platform, so to speak, but one that can work on the web and work on iOS and work on Android. And this is effectively what Google and Microsoft have done. So in Google's case with Material Design, and in Microsoft's case with Modern UI or Microsoft Design, they've, they've changed the name a few times because people got upset with it. The difficulty with this part, of course, is even if, so with material design, you have a really detailed spec, or a pretty detailed spec, which tells you a lot about how it's supposed to look. It also tells you 
what it is about the essences that make a component feel like it's a material design component. Because often, if you're going to build a custom thing, that won't be coloured in the spec. But at least it tells you things like, if you're going to do an animation, here are the sort of the, the attributes the animation has to have to feel like it fits in with other components. But still, when you get a concrete implementation of a material design component, it's still going to be a complicated beast. Uh, so on the web, um, Google have built at least two implementations of material design, polymer and angular material. They've also built them for iOS and Android. And uh, if you're a designer, or you give it to a designer in these implementations, they don't have to spend too long before they notice distinct differences between them. Almost to the point where, if you took the iOS version of material design and you gave it to an Android user, they might feel that something's slightly off. And on the web, we have, uh, there's an Angular version of it, there's a React version of it, Ember, uh, and they all have they're all complete to different levels. They all work on mobile and desktop to different levels of fidelity. So I think it's a, it's a good approach, but there's still, there's still the bottom line that a component takes a lot of time to mature and there's a lot of work that's gone into the native ones. So if we can't beat them, can we join them? Can we take our web frameworks and is there a way that we could, um, is there a way that we could leverage those native components and this, I think, is a much more interesting development in web frameworks that's happened very recently. So the idea is, um, in Ember, ultimately, you have a, a template compiler that will take a string, and ultimately what gets spat out, at least until very recently, was HTML. But could we abstract that? So instead of generating HTML, we generate kind of a virtual UI or a data structure, and then we can map that to the native framework. So the first use which got everyone excited about React was um, being able to generate a string on the server, and being which could be rendered directly, and being able to generate HTML markup in the, um, sorry, being able to generate DOM nodes in the, in the, in the browser. Um, that was, you know, that, that's the, uh, that's what get talked about, but it's really just the tip of a much bigger idea. So the idea is, instead of generating the markup directly as, say, uh, handlebars will do today, what our app instead generates is almost like a conceptual UI, something like, the, what, like what a designer might sketch out. If someone says, what is, you know, can you give me a sketch, can you give me a, what, what should this UI look like? One of the first things you'll get might be a low fidelity mockup. That essentially is what your app would generate. Uh, the framework in the middle is then responsible for turning that into iOS and Android views, HTML markup, DOM nodes, etc. And then when you interact with these, the native events flow back into the framework and get converted into synthetic events that go come back to your app. So there's a couple of you know, there's a few implementations of this idea that I know of. Um, I'll come on to that in a sec. So the idea is you wouldn't necessarily just have it's not write once uh, or write once run anywhere because an iOS app doesn't look like the same. It doesn't work the same way as an Android app from a design point of view. They have different behaviors and um, different usage pa UX patterns. So you're still going to need to do that work, but the advantage you can have as an app developer is that you could use the same style and approach to build an app for all of these platforms. And whereas with a web app, it might be pretty obvious that it's not a native experience, parts of it wouldn't feel right, you could have the end result feel native from a user's point of view, that they would have all the details, of the, that they would have all the, those details that are embedded in those 9,000 lines of code. But from an app developer's point of view, someone could take, someone who wasn't that familiar with, say, Java or Objective-C, could at least take the code and they could, they could work on it. So it's not, write once, run anywhere, it's at least learn the concepts once. Um, where, whereas today you'd have to learn Ember, Coca, etc. And there's a high, very high cost of building for each of these platforms in a way that's half decent. This is an interesting approach, I think, that you might, uh, that frameworks, that you might be able to reuse web frameworks like Ember or Angular uh, to deliver. So implementations of this idea uh, in Qt on the desktop, um, when they, when they first came to port it to mobile platforms, they figured that um, the approach they've been using for the longest time, which was to have generic buttons or text views or list views and just skin it for the platform, 
wasn't going to work because mobile platforms were so different amongst each other. So they came up with something called QML, and the idea there is that you specified a tree structure in what looked like a JSON object, um, and that would actually be, you, you could write it in the same style using the same tools for different platforms, but actually on the platforms themselves, they would be mapped into, mapped into native components. And then more recently on the web, this is the fundamental idea behind the way React works, is that instead of generating an actual an HTML string or DOM nodes, instead it generates this virtual UI data structure, which has the benefit of being very lightweight. And then there's a DOM implementation in the browser. There's React Native, which was announced recently. And if you want a demo, install Facebook groups on your phone. That's using it. And Flipboard announced yesterday React Canvas, which is where they wanted to bring Flipboard to the web. And the problem is every time they tried to touch the DOM, they found it ate too much into their frame budget. If you're trying to run at 60 frames a second, you've only got 60 milliseconds in which to do your work. So they figured, could they build themselves almost like a lightweight DOM as such, or just enough for what they needed? And they introduced React Canvas, which is where they use a canvas for all their rendering, but they had the convenience almost as if they were programming through the DOM by rendering. So they, they would build a virtual, they would build this virtual UI on the left, and then that would be rendered into nodes on a canvas. But you could imagine also WebGL, other outputs. So those are a couple of implementations, and React is the one that everyone's interested in. But what about Ember? Um, and this is where Ember very recently, its introduction of HTML bars could possibly be a, an avenue into this approach. So previously, handlebars was essentially a string generator. Put a template in, replace uh, tags with a mustache, generate DOM output. The interesting thing about handlebar HTML bars is it does at least, it generates actual DOM nodes. So potentially, there is, the, there is room into replacing this block down here with something else. So I'm not sure about whether that's, whether that's an avenue that uh, you wouldn't have anyone to talk about exploring that, but maybe it's a possibility for the future. But the, the interesting thing, I think, is it opens a nice new avenue up for a hybrid app. Uh, so just a, a summary of the things I've been learning on this little journey. So apps are all about components, and uh, in particular in native frameworks, components are complicated beasts. Uh, the, and there are two things happening, in, or three things going on in the web world, which will help us get closer uh, to being able to build those applications in the web. One is the extensible web project, or manifesto, which let, will give us the tools necessary to implement these complicated components in the browser without having to go through the whole standardization process. So those, the lower level components are built, the richer ones can probably fill on top of them, and then the richer ones that succeed, um, they can be standardized. Another is cross-platform design, which is not a technology thing, but at least it, if you're building for the web now, you could go and build, for example, something using material design, and then a user could use that app. And even though it's not the native framework on their phone or platform, it could feel familiar to them, because they will have used Google properties, they will have used Microsoft tools. So that, to some extent, mitigates the problem that it would feel out of place. And lastly, uh, another interesting sort of avenue of getting hold of this functionality but still being able to use web frameworks to write your apps is by abstracting away the, the way your app builds the UI from ultimately what gets rendered on screen and how the user interacts with it. Questions or comments? So, when it was used at my last line, do you have a sense for the complexity that that's trying to address? Is there any sort of composition of that that you can is there? Uh, I would say so. Some of it, some of that, some of that complexity would be stuff that you would get for free in the browser. Um, some of, but I would say it's spread over a lot of areas. The main thing is just there's a lot to a text view. You've got, say, it looks in a fairly simple widget on screen, but you have the layout going on, the rendering, um, individual lines of text, breaking them up, and so on. And in some I would expect, as well as all that, as well as that, as well. And if you look at simply the sheer size of the API, that can give you some idea. So I think it's simply, to some extent, because there's a lot of functionality being packed into these widgets. Um, you could argue that actually better thing to do would be to break up those widgets into sort of smaller chunks, 
So there is to some extent it's just simply because there's a lot of stuff bundled into into one thing. Uh, but I think the thing the important thing from a point of view of someone using that kind of framework is that when someone's building an app using a uh, native uh, using say um, Xcode or something, they will just plump the UI table view on, on, in their in their storyboard and probably they get all that functionality. They might not necessarily need all of it, but there's sort of all sorts of little behaviors that they catch them. So for example, you know, what happens when you long press and use them pop up, um, the speed of animations, um, there'll be things that you know, details about how the layout works and so on. So it can be spread amongst a lot of different facets, but it's simply because when people are interacting with you, perhaps they're used to interacting with apps which bundle all that functionality, whether it's needed or not. Sure. Oh, I have one quick question, which is, um, you know, it feels like a lot of the thinking, which is understandable right now, uh, is how can I use web technologies to emulate a native-like experience? Um, but if we were to move forward in a, a period of time and, and be, instead of trying to emulate a set of the, the Android experience, the iOS experience, the, whatever, you just said, let's just create the HTML, CSS, JavaScript experience for mobile devices. Um, does that change things at all? I mean, how, how you know, when, you're, when you stop, when you lose the old baggage associated with emulation and, and trying to be mimic and rather just create, because I think there's one of the big strengths of the web community is its scale and size, and, and there's this huge appetite from a kind of business entrepreneurial standpoint to adopt something that allows them to deploy into this. So there's this, you know, it's the whole VHS Datamax thing, you know, waiting to happen. I think that's very much the thinking behind something like material design is not, is effectively thinking about it's not just a technology problem. And once you, so the extensible web is an important thing that will need to happen and is happening. Right. When you get that, you could be able to build the performance and the responsiveness and the offline functionality that people will need. And at that point, building a mobile app and using as long as as long as you can build something that feels familiar, um, then yes, I think it, it does it, it does become a much more practical option. Um, I would suggest, however, there is always the thing that, of course, new models, new, new, new but the, the Android and iOS frameworks are not standing alone. New functionality is being introduced in all the time. New behaviors and people will you know, new native apps will continue to need to be developed very all the time. So there's. There is to some degree the extent of sort of the risk that we're kind of playing catch up, but you know having a, having this cross platform language and having enough people adopt it, that, that will I think help to a large extent. So if you use something like React Native, you're obviously not you're not programming in the uh, in the native APIs for the platform, and you're not using those idioms that are native to those platforms. Do you think it's a a reasonable trade-off. Do you think you gain enough by sharing the code across the different platforms that you are happy to not so not engage in fully? So one thing you absolutely need, and from the user-facing point of view, I would say if you're going to have if it, the you will need to you should have a design. If you're going to target a particular platform and you're going to sort of you, the amount of resources you could dedicate to that particular platform is limited. The best place to put it is the designer. So our design, we recently uh, are going to launch our Android app at work very soon, and our designer for that, used someone who's, who's lived his entire life, entire recent life, on Macs and iPhones, ditched his iPhone and spent spent, 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 spent spent a year just using an Android device to learn how to do Android design. So you need, I think, that kind of commitment to make stuff work. Um, in terms of the trade-off, there is a trade-off the whole way along the spectrum, and if you're building Fully native, you have a set of trade-offs to make. If you're building fully web, there's a, a set of trade-offs to make. And it's, it, the useful thing about the virtual UI is it simply adds another point to that spectrum. Um, so that which one, which um, something that's been a, something that's already well established is being able to run job, that's being able to run, being able to share a lot. Of, there are a number of ways of sharing code. So Google, Microsoft, etc. have found lots of ways to share the core code of their app and then they will build the entire UI. Um, usually have maybe even a separate team for each platform. So this adds kind of an intermediate on, on that front. But there is there's never will be a magic solution. <laughs>
just mention um, what is going on in the Ember space. So um, Miguel talks about fast boot, and that's that's um, rendering strings on the server. And part of the work that's gone into that is a React-like virtual DOM implementation. And uh, I know that a couple of years ago, one of the Ember core team had a go with uh, getting Ember views to interface with Titanium to generate iOS views. So it's something that's been experimented with before, and I imagine they'll look at again, or somebody in the community will look at again. Okay, that's it.